back like the seats of an 86 Delta 88 coupe on D's and bones, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Going live in a minute, Blizzard King. This is Winter Dennis Furlan Podcast. You are rocking with the realest black men represented. Ain't no lies because we winning. Catching flies, ain't no feelings. Uncle D, we the villain, baby. We just left the village, baby. Now we in them villas, baby. Dennis Furlan Podcast. Tuning in, we get it, baby. You can hate the player, hate the game. We love all you haters. Hate watch, hate watch. Calling lovely ladies, hands on your knees, bitch, bitch. you can thank us later, we snatching the crowns off of queens, we obliterate them, hella truth, chain the devil, they trying to eliminate us, you begging the sipping haters, peeling layers off potatoes, whoa, southern Cadillac music like outcast, ain't jumping without bass, tennis burning podcast, whoa. southern Cadillac music like outcast, ain't jumping without bass, tennis burning podcast, whoa. we have to clean up what's going on in our house before we do anything else. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the broadcast. This is Dennis Sperling. I'd like to give a big shout out to everybody on Instagram, everybody on Facebook, everybody on YouTube. Man, we are doing a broadcast for the ages here. Um, my name is Dennis Sperling, also known as Uncle D, the Blizzard King. You might know me from my fame, or you might know me from my infamy. <laughs> Either way, if you're tuned in, you know me. I'm pretty much one of the only attorneys that's willing to say what I want to say and I don't hold back largely because I'm successful enough that nobody can really tell me what to do. On top of that, what I'm speaking to you is the truth. My main problem is not where we are in America in general. It's not where we are as black Americans, but where we are in our culture. Big shout out to my man, the real MTR. Shout out to you, frat man. Keep up the great work, man. I'm so proud of that brother. Uh, when, Kevin Samuels passed away a few years ago, man. He was right there on my hip helping support the brother and his family. So um, either way, you know your real friends when you really need them. But anyway, big shout out to the real MTR, y'all. Go support him in his march towards a million. Nevertheless, what we are going to talk about tonight, big shout out to my man Joe Martin. Y'all make sure y'all hit the like button, the thumbs up button. And uh, let, let me know where you're checking in from. The other thing I'd like to do is I'd like to give a shout out to a young brother on this uh, YouTube spaces primarily. His name is Anton Daniels. I believe Anton is from the Midwest, specifically um, Detroit, right? Shout out to all my people from Detroit, man. Big shout out to the D. <laughs> I love Detroit. That's one of my favorite cities, man, between Detroit and Chicago. Uh, so, so, so he had a conversation with uh, one Dr. Boyce Watkins. And uh, as you guys know, my main issue with Boyce Watkins and my issue with people like Dr. Umar Johnson is, is the fact that they maintain those positions uh, which are detrimental to the black community. And they do so uh, under the covering of PhD or learned person. And so because of that, folks are more apt to listen to them. And so when I hear people like that make these statements, basically, when you really break down what they're saying, they justify degenerate behavior. Somebody type degenerate in the chat room. Somebody type degenerate behavior in the chat room. Degenerate behavior. OK, um, the title of this broadcast is Black to the Future, Leaving Ghetto Culture Behind. And the reason I say black to the future, because there was a time when black folks had left the ghetto culture behind. Those of you guys who are familiar with Thomas Sowell, he put out a, uh, a book, uh, or he has a, 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 a term called Black Redneck. And what that book and what that series talked about was the fact that this so-called African culture, which actually is not African at all, 
comes from the um, influence that Europeans from Scotland and Ireland had upon African Americans while we were enslaved. For instance, this jumping the broom to get married. That's not actually an African tradition. And that's something that comes from the UK. It was something that poor white Europeans in the UK did to get married. And so even the way in which we talk, we call it black vernacular. That's not actually uh, the way Africans speak. Some people will say, well, we juxtapose African dialect upon uh, an English. Basically, we put uh, African train cars on an English track. But no, that's not where we got that from. Words like finna and fixing to, those are words that came from poor Irish people, poor uneducated Scotsmen that came to the United States uh, pre-1700s, uh, pre who were enslaved at the time. And so we have to begin, even the way in which we fight, the way in which we uh, our mating habits. Oftentimes there was very strict uh, uh, sexuality was, was definitely something that was held uh, under control in Africa. It wasn't until we got to the United States that everybody started messing with everybody else anytime they wanted to. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit. But either way, I think this is going to be a very interesting subject because see here, the difference is between now and then, shout out to, uh, and the difference between now and when I say now, I'm talking about 2024 and beyond. In the 1960s, when we had this influx of ghetto culture coming to the black community, there's more of us now than there, there are of them. And, and what I mean is, and let me, uh, I'm actually going to pull this video up and I want to share something with you that I originally saw uh, on with BGS Ibmore. Shout out to one of the OGs, BGS Ibmore, man. Thank you so much for your work. I'm going to um, I'm going to pull this up now. I want y'all to check out this video that um, that uh, that was filmed, I guess, back in the 1920s or, or something like that. And so these, these are black people who are in Los Angeles, and at the time they were dealing with an influx of black. Black folks who were just migrating from the southern Mississippi, uh, other southern states like Arkansas, uh, um, Texas. And what you had was, I don't know if this pops up. I want to see if this is playing. If you can let me know. Get this to play. Let this me know if y'all can hear it. By 1970, there'll probably be a million Negroes in this city. And I know that people are concerned about this. They may not talk about it very often, but I certainly heard them shudder in church when he said there'd be a million Negroes in Los Angeles. We should. Okay. So the thing I want you to understand, if you guys who've read the books, Our Kind of People, those of you guys who are a long time Detroit natives who are long time um chicago natives if you have family that can date back three or four generations uh even white folks before the second migration into places like new york and chicago and detroit you had in los angeles you had african americans who had established themselves in those, those communities they had established themselves in those cities and they had their own functioning. Some of them were business owners. Some of them were um, uh, uh, politicians. Many were judges. They had basically made it, okay? And so now here we are in the 1920s, 1930s, 
and you have African Americans who are coming up from the rural South who are, uh, for lack of a better word, unsophisticated or ghetto. Okay. And, um, you know, my God, <laughs> now we got to deal with all these people. And so you hear this woman who happens to be from Los Angeles saying, we're going to have a million Negroes here in the United States, uh, uh, in, in front, uh, a million Negroes here in Los Angeles. And so she's freaking out because what is that going to do to the social climate? And what is it going to do to race relations when you have all of these folks coming over here doing what we know ghetto folks do? Let's keep listening. Sure, because we're saying, in essence, the majority of these people are not like we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, we felt that we, maybe some of us felt we left the South because we were getting away from this problem. We are a part of this exodus, too. But we are a little maybe embarrassed by the fact that here we're going to have a, a mass element come in that, that's going to create a tremendous social problem in the community to which we find a great deal of difficulty in relating to. So what he just said is, <laughs> yeah, we know we black, but they're not black like us. We're sophisticated. These folks are straight up out the country. Your country cousins are coming, and they are coming deep. And so what happened in the 1930s, and I hope I said the 1930s, what happened in the 1930s, all of these black folks from the South in an attempt to get away from Jim Crow came to these, these cities where black folks had already been. And guess what it did to race relations? What do you think? What do y'all think? Y'all hit the number one button if you hear me. You're going to learn something today, all right? And it's going to be slow getting there. But by the time we finish with this broadcast, you will have picked up on a lot. What do you think that did to race relations? Huh? What do you think happened? Well, yeah, you know, Tom or, or Bob, I know you're pretty cool, but my God, all these black folks coming in here from down south, they they cutting up, they acting a fool, they fighting in the street. Uh, uh, we don't want to live with them. You're going to have to live with them. These are your people. You're going to have to get these people, and th these are your folks. You're going to have to deal with them. And so, in other words, what he's saying was this small minority of upper middle class, middle class black folks is now being swarmed by ghetto folks. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is back in the 1950s and 60s. All right? 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. I believe this was actually filmed in the 1960s. Now, in 2024, as opposed to back then, 60% of black people, over 60% of black men are in the middle class, upper middle class, or rich. Back then, it was only one third of black people, specifically black folks in general, men and women who are in the upper middle class. So now we have twice as many folks who are middle class or upper middle class as they had back then. So in effect, we outnumber them. People who have made it out the ghetto, who are doing well for themselves, outnumber black folks in the ghetto. And so the numbers are at our advantage. And this is the progress that we've had over the past 60 years. This is not 1960. So when you hear folks talking about, oh yeah, you know, you're not, you know, you, you separating yourself, you know, you're not keeping it real, no. The new black culture, well, the well, the black black culture has become synonymous with ghetto culture. But now things are different. And I can understand why black culture was synonymous with ghetto culture when two thirds of black people are living in the ghetto and they operate uh, under the ideals and characteristics that ghetto people uh, operate under. But now the vast majority of black folk are in the upper middle class, middle class or rich. So think about that. Let's continue it's listening. I'm not like a do-gooder, <laughs> because I really am not, and I'm somewhat of a snob. But I do think that with these people coming in who are not our intellectual equals, no. She telling you the truth. They're not our intellectual equals. You trying to compare people who live in, 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 in the city, who attend plays, to people who hang out in juke joints. You talk about people who are coming from an agrarian society in Alabama to a place like a sophisticated Los Angeles with movie stars. 
and PhDs and doctorates and paved concretes and sidewalks and lighting and indoor toilets. Some of these folks didn't have indoor toilets until they moved to Los Angeles and Detroit and Chicago. I know my family who moved from Mississippi had an outhouse that they used to use until they moved to the east side of Los Angeles. And I understand, now some people come and they want better, but the vast majority of people bring their culture with them. And so that's what this woman is talking about. So what I'm trying to say, look, and I want y'all to listen, because see, this is a very nuanced conversation. Some folks will call you snooty for saying that you look down on ghetto culture because ghetto culture has become synonymous with black culture. But that's not us that put that on us. That's the dominant society laying, uh, 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 projecting upon us that black culture is ghetto. So let's keep listening. Are they about sociological uh, bracket? Uh, they're not to be a handicap to us. They'll find their own level. Now, I do sound like a snob, but I don't mean it this way. But they're used to living a certain way, and they too might uh, rise, up, uh, rise up above their origin and might one day mm -hmm. be out of social. The whole tone of this meeting is a way. She's willing, this woman here is willing to. That sister right there said, we should give them a chance. They can rise above their, their circle. Yeah, they might be a little ghetto, a little rough around the edges right now. But they can rise above that station in life. Okay? And this is, this is her opinion. All right? And so you got back and forth. You see? They, and, and so these are the debates that these folks was having. Let's keep listening. They're setting us up up as little puppet Jesuses. We can't help anyone else until we help ourselves. We can't help anybody else until how are we going to bring these people up out their ghetto <laughs> fabulous feelings and lifestyle unless we're able to help ourselves. We haven't gotten a position to help ourselves yet. Keep listening. The Negro has had two professions, his own medicine, dentistry, uh, law, uh, psychiatry, and he's had the profession of being a Negro. And now, I found that to be very interesting. He said the Negro has had only two professions. He could be a, a, a doctor, a psychiatrist, a lawyer, et cetera, whatever, or he can be a Negro. You can't be both. In other words, you can be acculturated, you can be learned, you can be professional, or you can be a Negro. In other words, you can be ghetto. You can't be both. It's ironic now that we see a lot of so-called, uh, I guess as we call them, um, Boss chicks who want to be both. You want to be both a a, 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 a prosecutor in a major American county, a, and, and then you also want to be a boss chick with, with, with a with a side dude, I guess. Okay, and we see how that worked out. It it fails. Somebody type Fanny Willis in the chat room. Uh, let's keep listening. Many of us have come out here to escape from this second profession of being a Negro. And we are out here a while and we're working in our own field, and then we find out that here these same problems are falling on the heels of 1,600 Negroes a month that come into Los Angeles. Now you hear that? 1,600 black folks a month coming to Los Angeles. This is totally throwing our mind you back then. They might have had you know, 30, 40,000 black people. Now they talk about 1,600 a month. So we talking about in a matter of two or three years, you got double the amount of black folks, but you got black folks coming from the ghetto who are unacculturated, as they say. Let's keep listening. And so this is going to be a problem. What is this going to do to your school? Your upper middle class, middle class black children are now going to school with kids who are fresh out of Alabama, Mississippi ghetto. Uh, may or may not have uh, worn shoes to school, uh, are used to a, a, a segregated South, may or may not be able to read and write. Parents may not be able to read and write, mostly blue collar, unskilled labor. So they have never had anything. So this is what the, this is what this is the ghetto culture that our ancestors had to deal with when it came to the big cities. Let's keep listening. Now this 
Christian art problem. It's our own view. It's our own identifying with these Negroes that are coming in with their carpet bags that causes us problems. This is our basic embarrassment that we as Negroes have. We want to live together, yet we want to sort of scatter to the far winds and live amongst our... Well, I found that interesting. That was the last little point. I'm going to let y'all listen to that again. Listen to this. Identifying with these Negroes that are coming in with their carpet bags that causes us problems. This is our basic embarrassment that we as Negroes have. We want to live together. This is our basic embarrassment that we as uh, in Negroes have. Listen. Together, yet we want to sort of scatter to the far winds and live among. We want to live together, yet and still we want to scatter to the winds and live far apart. In other words, what they're saying is we would like to be able to live together, but we can't because there are people who have differing values. And because of those differing values, it makes it nearly impossible to live with them. Now, we're about to get into a very detailed lecture. That was kind of like my opening. I want you guys to uh, sit back, hit the number one button, and uh, we're going to begin when I come back. Y'all make sure y'all show me some love by hitting the number one button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you hadn't already. Uh, in the meantime, I'll be right back. burning podcast, click your mouth pad. Yeah, we out back. Uh, hit the like, hit subscribe. Don't just hate watch, cause we outside. Uh, let them hate watch, go and play pop. We just lay by, he don't play that. We don't play back, we don't play back. We go way back. Black man, yeah, we earn some. Tune in, gotta learn some. Uncle D podcast, bump it. Likes up, hit the sub button. Black man, yeah, we earn some. Tune in, gotta learn some. Uncle D podcast, bump it. Likes up, hit the sub button. This is Dennis Burning Podcast. Don't just hate, watch. Hit subscribe and let them know we outside. Don't hold hate, donate. Super chat, cash chat. Put something in the collection plate. Church. Church. I want y'all to make sure y'all hit the number one button. And we're going to kind of get back to what we like to do over here, man. I need y'all to check in at a certain point when it's time to check in. I need to check in it, to checking in, to start happening again. We got to go ahead and get this algorithm pumping. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome back to the broadcast. The cash app is uh, rolling low below the screen. Uncle D is live. Shout out to my man, Kenneth Williams. Thank you so much for the uh, super chat, super sticker, actually. I appreciate everybody and your contributions. I'm going to try to roll through this. You guys know what to do uh, when it's time to do it. But um, basically, the theme for this broadcast is there's more of us than there are of them. Now, my problem is not with black people. My problem is not with uh, black folks in America. My problem is with our culture. See, it's not a color thing. It's a culture thing. I've been saying this for years. Oftentimes, African-American women, the lovely ladies, they get angry with me because I point out the degenerate culture that they're passing down to our children. Because I've seen it pro progressively get worse over the years. You see, we went from... Ladies wearing short skirts, dancing a little, gyrating a little loose in the club. So now they are literally popping and twerking and showing their butts during brunch time, family time on Sunday in any restaurant in America on top of the tables. You see them breaking it down in the street in front of the police officers for all the world to see. The whole world can see all their, their good parts. And this same mentality comes about because of the culture that was passed down to them from the thoughts that raised them. And they're passing it down and making a whole generation of thoughts and simps and suckers and men who are willing to tolerate that sort of culture. And it's only going to get worse. You're going to start seeing, it's, it, because of, and, 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 and we, if we talk about the sexual deviancy, de deviancy, you're looking at a situation where you got women, they have no sexual restraint. So what does that mean? And I hate to say this, but you're going to start seeing women 
having sex with their own sons, doing sexual acts with their own sons. It's going to be as common as, as, as any other sex act. This is what I'm telling y'all. This is where we're headed. They will be defiling their own sons. I, and I know you guys don't want to hear that, but you already see it. What, do you, what kind of ancestral foolishness when you have a young man who may be, I don't know, uh, whatever age he is, smacking his mom on the butt while she's dancing? We've seen that pop up, that same video from different people pop up multiple times over the, same, uh, uh, the past few years, haven't we? Haven't we? We've seen that, haven't we? This is what happens when you have a degenerate culture. It goes down and down and down and down into the levels of, of, of a swine trough. You see? So what you have now is this. You have a profound transformation. Now, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, we had a lot of folks, and it doesn't necessarily, just because you're poor doesn't mean you have to be uh, degenerate. What happened was in the 1980s and 90s, we sold our soul. We, it was, we, we decided it was acceptable to sell drugs to our own people. Both men and women benefited. Yeah, the men might have been out there selling it, but it was some woman sitting behind the scenes who benefited from that crack money. So at that point, we put money over everything. It was a get the bag culture before we know what get the, get the bag was. And so what happens? It's been a spiraling down ever since then. Black men and black women did anything to each other. We murdered each other. We, we, I'm sorry, we unalived each other for, for money. Either a slow death or a fast death, whether it was a drive-by shooting or a crack or heroin sale. This is what we did. And so that was the turning point. And from there, you had the, the mass incarceration, the music that came up out of that time period, the degenerate music, the, the, the two live crews, all the way to your Nicki Minaj's and, 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 and your uh, Queen Bees. See, but now in recent years, there's been a transformation, a profound transformation within the black community. And it's characterized by a socioeconomic shift. You see? That ghetto culture, which was synonymous with black culture, was largely rooted in the demographic realities of the mid 20th century. And during that era, you had an influx of Southern blacks into the major, major northern cities and the western cities like Los Angeles and California. Their, numero, their, their, their numbers, the sheer numbers that they came with or, or their numerical dominance, if you will, because there were so many of them, the majority rule, and that was the black culture uh, that was dominant. And people saw poverty and they saw underprivileged living conditions which gave rise to a certain culture. But now, as we move to the 2020s and 2024s and, and beyond, there's a new reality that has emerged where the middle class and the higher income African-Americans now outnumber their counterparts living in underprivileged conditions. If you broke and poor now, if you a black person, and you poor now in the ghetto, you choose to be. Because see, with the gig economy, all you need is to borrow somebody's car. Hell, I think they'll even buy you a car. And you can go do Instacart, Uber Eats, all these sort of delivery services with this gig economy. There's just absolutely no reason to be broke and poor anymore. So even our students, even our young people have the opportunity to make money. So we shifted from the majority of black Americans living in poverty in the 1960s to a state where the majority of black folks are in the middle class or upper middle class now. 
And whether you're a hardworking truck driver, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a plumber, whether you're a military guy, shout out to all my military dudes, man. Shout out to everybody, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, uh, Coast Guard. Big shout out to all my military guys. I haven't given you guys a shout out, man. We appreciate you guys. Hand clap for the military guys. And also hand clap for the hardworking blue collar guys, the truck drivers, the electricians, the welders, the plumbers. Um, all you guys, man, thank you so much for keeping the construction workers. Thank you so much for keeping our country going. We need you. We love you. We appreciate you. Irrespective of what these silly broads say, you are the backbone of the country. Of the country. Look, I'm a lawyer. Forget me and all the rest of the white collar workers. Forget us. It's you guys that keeps this country going. I can look. Let me tell you something. <laughs> you 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 you're gonna need you're gonna need a plumber, an electrician, and a construction worker more often than you're gonna need a lawyer in your life. Okay. So big shout out to all you guys, man. But nevertheless, man, let me uh, let me get back to it. Shout out to Trill Team Six. Shout out to Mr. Sperling and the Ice Mob. Yeah, man. Shout out to the Ice Mob. Shout out to all the Ice Lords. But um, back to what I was saying. Okay, so we've gotten to a point now that there's more blacks who are doing well and in the middle class than in, in poverty. And so the ghetto culture that used to be pervasive, uh, it, they don't have the numbers that they used to have. OK. And the journey towards this transformation. It began with a significant increase in educational attainment by both black men and black women, higher levels of education, which opened doors for both job opportunities and entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, and so now also you got more black men who are role models and mentors. I think I'm probably the third or fourth, three or four black lawyers who are on the internet. Back in the day, it was hard to even meet a black lawyer, much less, much less be able to turn to an internet station or YouTube station and see one. And so you got role models. You see? Um, the growing number, and shout out to your excellence, sir. Thank you so much. He said he gifted five. Give to Five Feet Podcast membership. Thank you. Yeah, man, thank you so much. And big shout out to my man, Kwame Smith. Uh, the thing you guys, uh, 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 on a side note, members, uh, a lot of my videos have disappeared because they're now under the membership paywall. So you got to join the membership. If you haven't joined the membership, all that stuff that I used to do, all that those those classics, you got to become a member if you want to see them. All that stuff, the vet. The vast majority of my work from the past three or four years is behind the paywall now. So you guys want to check that good stuff out, you got to become a member. So shout out to your excellence, sir, for, for, for bringing in some members. Now, um, I want to kind of get back to this. Um, we are now in a situation where, as I said before, there are more affluent, well-to-do upwardly mobile black folks and there are then there are just straight up poor folk it, it just it's not there anymore okay so the question is what's going to happen now well before when you had the influx of black folks coming in they drove everything down into the ground they drove our culture into the ghetto and i want to kind of explain that to you guys so and, and let's start off with, uh, are y'all with me? Make sure I'm not boring you because this is going to be a bit of a lecture and it's going to take a minute for, for us to get there. And I, I want to just explain, to see a lot of people will look at these black folks here and, and say, oh, they're just snooty. Oh my God, they're just snooty. How, how dare they say that about their fellow black folk? Okay. Lo and behold, White people had the same issue, okay? Not just with the influx of migrants coming or immigrants coming from Europe to, uh, uh, to the United States via Ellis Island. Not just that, but even in the 1930s, they had the migration of the Okies and the Arkies. Are you guys familiar with that? Somebody type Okie in the chat room. Matter of fact, they got a football team uh, in Oklahoma referred to the Okies. The Okies and the Arkies, and this term or this colloquial phrase 
uh, was used to describe people who came in from Oklahoma and Arkansas, and they ended up in California during the Dust Bowl. And that was around the 1930s. And what basically happened was there was a series of severe dust storms that damaged uh, the ecology and the agriculture uh, in the United States uh, and, and Canada on the prairies. So the farming techniques that were being used kind of just stripped the land of all its nutrients. Instead of farming plot here, plot here, you, you soybeans here, uh, corn here, potatoes here when you're in rotate, it just stripped the land of its nutrients. And, 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 and basically, you just ended up with a dust bowl. You know, there was nothing you could do there. So these were a series of environmental disasters. And then couple that with the Great Depression. And guess what? People had to get out of the Midwest. The stock market crashed. They were looking for a new life. The environmental disaster. They needed to get somewhere else. And so a lot of families from places like Oklahoma and Arkansas, but also Texas and many other surrounding states, they left their home states and they went to California. Okay. Now guess what happened when they moved to California? These are primarily white folks. They were forced to migrate westward. Remember there was that big land rush. The government offered free land to white folks who wanted to move to the Midwest. So a lot of white folks moved from, uh, places like, uh, you know, Chicago, Illinois, New York, they moved all the way to the Midwest. And then, then they got out there for a little while, and then they got hit with that old dust bowl. And so now it's time to move further west. Now, the reaction of the Californians, the the, the wealthier Californians, they it was mixed. But more often than not, it was negative. And, um, you know, the people in California, the majority of them, um, looked at the newcomers as basically as country bunkins. Um, they 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 saw them as backwards. They saw them as ill-educated, poor, desperate. They thought that they threatened the the, the social fabric. You know, they thought that they were going to threaten the economic stability of the community. They didn't want their kids going to school with these Okies and Arkies. And this is white people and how they treated other white people. This is in the 1930s. Now, just prior to that and during that time period, you had the migration of black Americans coming from the South to California. Now, they didn't just go to California. They also went to uh, cities in the north. It was referred to as the Great Migration. It uh, occurred in two major waves. The first was from 1960 to 1940. The second was from 1941 to 1970. These people, this video was taken in the 1960s. So this is the actual um, second wave. But in my opinion, it was third wave because there were people who came before the 1900 who came in 1880 who moved out of the south uh during the uh uh the, after the civil war ended and they went to detroit because you always have free black people in, in 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 those other places uh other than the south there's always been free black people but shout out to my man kwame smith again thank you so much for five bucks but anyway the mass of these people the movement was driven by a combination of a push uh, to get the heck out of the South and go North and West uh, because of the, the, the gym, the racial segregation, the Jim Crow laws that we're dealing with. Oh my God, the lynching, you know, the KKK had popped up and these night Riders and they were basically taking black folks lands. And, and one thing you got to understand is a lot of the lynchings that occurred were white people in the South lynching the economic prosperous black men and women, those who own shops. They were oftentimes trying to get rid of competition. You owned a shop and you were a black man and this white guy owned a shop in a competitor shop down the street. Hey, let's just go over there and lynch old Bob and in that way, I don't have any competition in this town. You see, capitalism at its worst. 
So keep that in mind. It wasn't just racial all the time. It had a lot more to do with financial. Keep that in mind when we consider the history of lynching in America. And I believe, you know, when, when people start really doing the history on that, you'll find there's a lot of surprising things about uh, American history that we don't know. Shout out to the real Dale Jennings. Thank you so much. Uh, but anyway, we're, we were trying to escape that. We were trying to, black Southerners want to get the hell away from that, you know? Uh, racial tensions were high. Uh, you know, the justice system wasn't obligated to protect a black person, whether it be in their person or their property. You know, white folks were stealing land one way. I mean, they, I mean, they would paper whoop you to death. It's like trying to play a cricket guard game and you got your, your worst enemy over there keeping the score. You just lose no matter what. You can never get ahead. So they said, you know, the, 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 the game is rigged. We're going to get out of here. You know, on top of that, there was limited opportunities in the South. Um, many black people were sharecroppers. And for you guys who don't know, somebody type sharecropper in the chat room. This is part of American history. So my parents were sharecroppers. My mother was a sharecropper. She was 14 when she left Mississippi. My grandmother was a sharecropper. Her husband, my granddad, was a sharecropper. What is sharecropping? Well, it's basically when you live on a plot of land owned by somebody else, typically a white landowner, and you farm his land, and he supplies you with the supplies that you need and allows you to live rent-free, and you can go down to a corner a, a, a a local store, general store, which he probably owns or maybe one of his friends own or whoever owns it. And then basically you work all year, you, 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 you harvest the cotton or whatever product is on the land. And then you go cash it in and you pay all your debts. Often what happened was by the time you got through paying your debts by the cotton or the product that you traded in, you didn't have any money left. Matter of fact, you were still in debt. So every year, the, you working and working and working, you getting more debt. Back then, having children was an asset because it means you had more people to help, but guess more people to help do the work. But what happens when you get more people? You get more people, more debt, more mouths to feed, more clothes. You see? So this whole sharecropping system was basically a... Uh, a cycle of debt and poverty. It never really worked out for folks, but it was a way in which to keep blacks in the same, virtually the same position they were in post uh, the end of slavery. So, um, you know, the other thing is they had pestilence. I read somewhere that they had a bull weevil infestation. Oftentimes the soil was poor from over farming and bad farming techniques. Um, and so it's just, it's just time to go. Just natural disasters, flood. We didn't have the technology. And that's what pulled people north and west, and they were looking for industrial jobs. Um, and, and the north and the west all offer these industrial jobs, particularly during the World Wars, okay? Because remember, between 1919 uh, all the way to 1940, we had a couple of World Wars that we had to deal with, okay? And... Um, there was a demand for increased labor. And so black folks, you know, they got the low paying jobs and it was a hard labor, but uh, it was still a significant improvement over the agriculture work we had been doing in the South. On top of that, you had better opportunities, better educational opportunities for your children in the North and the West. Um, and, you know, and, and even though there were some disparities that remained, it was just a better look, you know, and then on top of that, you had a better social political climate, even though racism was pervasive uh, and it wasn't absent in the North and the West, it was a lot less oppressive than in the Jim Crow South. And so they hedged their bets and they left. On top of that, you know, uh, many had family in places like, um, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, New York. And that helped serve as a factor. My family had relatives in Chicago. My uh, mother's sister moved to Chicago, Illinois. 
And uh, she lived there. I still have relatives in Chicago. I think Kiwani, Illinois, somewhere like that. And so they already have family that they can go up there and 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 and, and set up shop with. So you know, it, it it was a pool, and so that's what happened. But now, what happens when you have this mass migration of Southern blacks? And we get it. We understand why you moved up there. But man, what does that do? That's what we're going to talk about when we get back. Y'all. Going live in a minute, Blizzard King. This is Winter Dennis Ferlin Podcast. You are rocking with the realest black men representing. Ain't no lies because we winning. Catching flies, ain't no feelings. Uncle D, we the villain, baby. We just left the village, baby. Now we in them villas, baby. Dennis Ferlin Podcast. Tune in we get it, baby. You can hate the player, hate the game. We love all you haters. Hate watch, hate watch. Calling lovely ladies. Hands on your knees. You can thank us later. We snatching the crowns off of queens. We obliterate them. Tell the truth, train the devil. They trying to eliminate us You begging the sipping haters Peeling layers off with haters Whoa Southern Cadillac music like outcast Ain't jumping without bass Tennis burning podcast Whoa. Southern Cadillac music like outcast Ain't jumping without bass Tennis burning podcast And for you men out there You simps Who are defending this degenerate behavior By black women Because to you the black woman is queen Understand that you are nothing more than an enabler. You are her heroin dealer. You are the one that protects her and feeds her this 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 degenerate uh, uh, a drug. This this uh, and allows for this immoral character, which is undermining our nation of black people. And you too deserve what she gets, chastisement. But because you're a man and you're in the way of progress, you are our enemy. Because anyone who is in the way of black men correcting the bad behavior of black women, you, sir, are an adversary. Now, I understand there are a lot of black men who have daughters. And your natural inclination is to protect your daughter. But if your daughter is exhibiting poor behavior and you are not correcting that poor behavior and thus intensifying the problems that we have here in the United States, then you're an inadequate father. You're a weak man. And you didn't deserve to be a father in the first place. More importantly, you're not operating by the code that you need to operate by. And you need to be checked because you're out of line. You got a new group of black men coming along. All right. Welcome back to the broadcast, man. Shout out to everybody in the chat room. Y'all hit the number one button. Shout out to everybody on Instagram. Shout out to everybody on Facebook, man. If you are on Instagram right now, go ahead and hit the one button, man. Let me know you guys are in here. And then check in, too. i like to know where you guys are coming in from. Where are my people from Chicago, Detroit, London, England? All y'all, man. I want to hear you guys. Is, uh, I want to see y'all. I want to I want to see where y'all at, man. So make sure y'all do that. Check in. Let's make sure we keep this thing live. And matter of fact, go ahead and type Dennis Sperling in the chat room. Type the Dennis Sperling podcast in the chat room. Let's get that to be part of the, a part of the uh, algorithm. And again, we're talking about black to the future, leaving ghetto culture behind. And now you guys are starting to see why I refer to this as black to the future, because we've dealt with this issue before. We had an influx of ghetto culture, and it's taken us this long to get back to where we would have been in the 1940s. Okay, let me give you an example. So um, mass migration, you got all these southern blacks coming to these northern cities uh, after World War II. And what that did was it changed the makeup of the black culture in those cities. It altered the demographic and cultural landscape in in the urban communities. You see, you got, um, you know, for instance, let's look at this. In 1900, 1900, half of the population in New York State had been born outside the state. Right? That's a lot. That's a lot. And a lot of these newcomers were from the South and they came to these Northern cities. It not only drastically increased the population of the black community from 30,000 to 277,000 in 40 years. That was in Chicago. It went from 30,000 to 277,000 by 1940. That's within somebody's lifetime. All these country folk coming up 
talking ghetto, acting ghetto, shooting, cutting up, shooting dice. Chicago was nice back in the 1900s. Same thing for Detroit. In Detroit, they saw an increase from $4,000 in 1900 to 149000 in 1940. We had schools in 1900. We had our own enclaves. There are white people that can say, yeah, I remember back when Black Detroit was the place to be back in 1901 or eight, whatever. But then when you had all these ghetto folk come up from the South, yeah, and I know they came for good reasons. They were trying to escape racism, but they brought with them this uneducated, unacculturated uh, 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 persona collectively manifested in the culture. And they brought it to these northern cities. So what you do, if, you, if you're part of the white population, what do you do? Look at all these people mad at these migrants coming up here to New York. They're black, they're Latino, they're white, but they're not like y'all. They're not like you snooty black folks in New York, son. Somebody type son in the chat room. Yo, son. <laughs> they're not like you, son. No. They're not like you either, poppy. They fighting in the street. They pissing on trees. I saw a video on Instagram the other day. I guess this dude, he's either Dominican or Puerto Rican, and he was telling this Venezuelan mother, why you don't respect the children? It's a school right here. You peeing on the tree, son. He was speaking Spanish to him. So imagine that. This is what happened. Imagine if you went from, okay, you got 50,000 black folks in the United States. Uh, uh, you got all these people. Uh, uh, let's use a Hispanic community. You got 100,000 Hispanic people in the Bronx. 10 years from now, it's 400,000 Hispanic people in the Bronx, and that extra 300,000 came from Venezuela, from the slums of Venezuela. Right? What would that do to the Bronx? It's going to turn it into mini Venezuela. Less educated, less acculturated. Same thing happened to the black community. It was a shock to the black community. And the white folks was like, whoa. Oh, uh-uh. Y'all got a higher rate of crime, violent crime. The birth, out of wedlock birth rate when it was off the chain. It was far different than those born in the North. There was a higher rate of violence when they tested, when they looked in the 20th century, when they looked at Pennsylvania and Washington. They found that there was a higher rate of violent crimes by blacks who had migrated to, the, to those cities as opposed to who had born there. It was nearly five times as high, it, it, uh, 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 higher than those who were born in Pennsylvania. Because remember, in the South, a black man's life was very, it was not very black man or woman. Wasn't worth very much. Having babies and getting somebody pregnant and running off, that was the thing to do. So they had higher out of wedlock birth rates. That's why they would send you down South. Somebody type down south in the chat room. Why do you think them folks in the northern countries, with the northern states, would send you down south to have that out of wedlock baby? And when you had that baby, they'd bring you back because it was pretty common down there. That was the whole point of sending you down south so you wouldn't be ostracized and kicked out. There's plenty of other pregnant baby mamas down there. Shout out to my man, Eternal Dom, Uncle D. Sperling, the, uh, Uncle Dennis Sperling, the great. Thank you for everything. We miss these lies. Thank you so much, bro. Now, what happened? Because, see, I want you guys to understand something. L listen to me now. What happened? What was the reaction to this migration? It wasn't just, it didn't just lead to social change, but it also led to a significant change in residential patterns. What do you mean? 
What I'm saying is, before all these ghetto black folks, these country black folks with the shooting and killing and making babies, moved to Detroit and Chicago and New York, racial segregation in housing, it, 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 wasn't, it, it wasn't as pronounced in those northern cities. What? Yes, let me say that again. Black folks and, and white folks kind of intermixed and lived together. Yeah, your next door, it's, it's 1901 and your next door neighbor is a, a, a lawyer or a doctor, or an engineer, a blacksmith, a business owner, and you're a business owner and you do business together, you might be more apt to live next to him. Same cultural ideals, same middle-class values. He's a Protestant, you're a Catholic, ah, we can work together. He's a Southern Baptist, you're Jewish, hey, no big deal, you know? But with the arrival of these Southern Blacks, with these ghetto folks, with their different cultural practices, that's when they came and they said, no, no, we, we gonna have to separate ourselves <laughs> by racial segregation, okay? It's already bad enough we gotta deal with these Arkies and Okies. We got our own poor whites, ghetto folk that we gotta deal with. We're not gonna deal with yours either. So they, so they, it, it forced these cities to move towards these rigid racial segregation style uh, 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 terms as far as living. They didn't want to be around that. And it was enforced through violence and legal measures. See, throughout the, you, the history of the United States, remember when we first got here, when people first came and, 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 and gaffled the Indians for the land, Everybody was just over here trying to survive. And then when they decided that we wanted to have a racial hierarchy so we can keep the economic system of this country going, we decided to have a racial caste system because we don't want these white men marrying these black women. And we sure don't want these black men marrying these white women and having these little uh, uh, biracial babies because that's going to mess up our social caste system. We want white to be on top and white to be the dominating ruling class. And we want black to be the servant class. So they separated, okay? They, they, for, they put laws in place to say, okay, this is, you know, 1680, uh, and we're going to have to separate y'all. I know you like it, but we're going to have to separate y'all. So they made it illegal for folks to get married and inheritance. And, and so, then you know, after the Civil War was over around about in 1880, you know, these blacks, these blacks aren't so bad. You got some educated ones amongst them, and they've served in Congress, some of them, and you know, they're educated. All right, we'll, we'll hang out with them. And so things loosened up. And then with the influx of all these other folks from the South, it tightened up again. Shout out to my man, the real Dell Jennings. He said, uh, remember during Obama, so many black folk were marching for immigration and DACA. And some of us warned about them supplanting a black vote. Yeah, yeah. You know, not just the black vote. They want to supplant you, brother. <laughs> they trying to supplant you. I'm not worried about a vote. They're trying to supplant you. Um, but anyway, so now that you got all these black folks who've come up from the South, the white folks are like, hold on a minute. We're going to send y'all over to Harlem, okay? And that's why Harlem became one of the first great northern black ghettos, okay? Because, see, it was still predominantly white as of the late 1910s. That's where the immigrants came through, man. That's a, Harlem used to be filled up with uh, Italians and folks like that, Jewish people, okay? But with the uh, change in the racial dynamics and the enforcement of these resident, this residential segregation, it, it basically marked a regression in race relations in the North. And it was driven largely by the cultural shock and, 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 and the backlash against these newly arrived black folks who was ghetto as hell. You see? Nobody wants to be around ghetto people.
And this had profound implications in these established black communities in the cities like Harlem, Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and Seattle. These were our learning centers, our best and brightest came from here. We had some of the best schools, some of the best educated students who could, they could have gone on and went to Harvard or something like that. This is where your Booker T. Washingtons and, and Thurgood Marshalls came from, all these brilliant minds. You see? All these brilliant people. But you can't do that if you got a bunch of ghetto folks in the class now. The ghetto people out in that. Now, if you speak proper English, guess what? You talking white. And the white folks said, no, we, yeah, we, we like you sophisticated black folks cool. And there was a time we were cool, but you established black families. This is your problem. So in the 1950s and 60s, black people, the sophisticated, upper we low mouth uh, black folks, they were locked in the ghetto with these Southern blacks who had just came up. And the tensions reflected it. It was tense. That's when we start coming up with what is our racial identity? That's when black culture became synonymous with ghetto. Here you are, your father's a lawyer, your mother's a school teacher, and you in school with a bunch of ghetto folks whose family come from the sharecropping South. And they out there telling you you're not black because you speak white, because you speak standard English. And it basically drove down, it drove down the quality of life in the black community. And it also set us back as far as our, our intellectual achievement and business accomplishment. Because you got people who are used to doing what? making babies, fighting, shooting, doing nothing productive, laying around. And I'm not saying there wasn't hardworking people coming out of the South. But there is some issues. See, at that time, before the influx of these folks who came in from the first and second migration, Black and Japanese families at that, out in California, they faced, they had severe racial prejudice and barriers in, in, in that state, but they still were able to establish economic and social networks that mirrored the white middle-class neighbors that they had. What did they value? Education, stable employment, the cultivation of social status, that was important. On the con by contrast, you had black folks who, who just came out the South. They were struggling with poverty. They lacked formal education. They didn't fit in the existing social hierarchy. Shout out to my man, Johnny Vegas. Thank you so much for the super sticker. But the white folks in the middle class and the black folks in the middle class, they got along a little better in these established communities. We had something. In places like Oakland and Los Angeles, they had their own businesses, their own churches, their own social clubs. They provided social and economic support 
but they also em emphasize the importance of family and education and political engagement. You can barely get these people to vote. Go ask them. They'll tell you they ain't going to vote. I'm not voting. They tell you that. Barely want to get a job, some folk. Definitely don't want to get it. They call it the white man's education. Go listen to them. These are the same values that the Irish and the Scots had when they came over from England or came over from the UK that they put off on, on uh, 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 the black folks who were around them. That rubbed off on us. And here we are in 2024, and you still got people who are against the so-called white man's education. They're against proper uh, speech and, 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 and political engagement. It's the same thing. You get it from the Irish. You think, oh, yeah, I'm... No, nah, that's they didn't like it. They didn't like it because the English used to whoop up on them all the time. The Scots. I think England, the English and the Scots, they just finished the war <laughs> about 10 years ago. They've been fighting it for two or three hundred years. Or has it been a thousand years? But see, with those things that we had with those those established communities, man, we had uh, and I remember this growing up in LA. Central Avenue, somebody type Central Avenue, that Central Avenue corridor in Los Angeles. That was like a cultural hub for music, specifically for jazz. And it was surrounded by black owned businesses and residential areas. Where education and economic advancement were highly valued. You can't rebuild the black community without the black elite. You can't rebuild the black community without um established neighborhoods and communities. All you're going to get in the ghetto is turmoil and chaos. And the only way you're going to get the black elite to come back is if they are in charge. Because if they are in charge, they're going to do what? Make sure you have stability. I mean, look, racism is never going to go anywhere. But back then, black folks dealt with it. That's external. Irrespective of that, black folks still made inroads in various professions, law, medicine, academia, and they became successful entrepreneurs. They reached the middle class, upper middle class, home ownership. They had neighborhoods even if they were segregated. And these neighborhoods mirrored those suburban living standards of white folks. What destroyed all that? When them ghetto folks came up and tore it up. And I know that's hard to hear. I know that's hard to hear. But look, just cause you all skin folk ain't kin folk. You understand? And just cause you share the same culture does not mean you share the same cultural values. It's no different than with these black immigrants who we have coming over here to the United States from these different African cult countries. They have a different cultural standard than we do. And it's not something that's uncommon. Black immigrants face, when we came from, when our black ancestors came from the South to the North and the West, they faced the same thing that the white immigrants faced when they went from Oklahoma, Louisiana, or Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas to the West. It's normal. But the difference is white folks know how to put their white folks off on, look, you need to get yourself together. Black folks are forced to accept that ghetto culture and make it one and uh, uh, make it our own. We have to accept that ghetto culture as black and make it synonymous black. And what does that do? It drives everything down. Now, what issues were they facing? Let, let's talk about ghetto culture. Y'all with me? <laughs> we are all into this thing. Are y'all with me? Now, what, what were they dealing with? Let's look at this video again. I want y'all to hear these black folks, these black 
Hey, folks, again. Let me know if you can hear this. Seventy. Million people in the use. city. And I know that people are concerned about that. Are able to hear that? Looks like it's breaking in and out. Let me know if y'all can hear that. But we are a little maybe embarrassed. With the mind. By 1970, there'll probably be a million Negroes in this city. And I know that people are concerned about this. They may not talk about it very much. Keep in mind, at that time, it was about 40,000. Somebody said the audio is bad. Are y'all able to hear it now? I certainly heard him shudder in church when he said there'd be a million Negroes in Los Angeles. Hmm. We shudder because we're saying, in essence, the majority of these people are not like we are. And uh, we felt that we. Maybe some of us felt we left the South because we were getting away from this problem. We left the South because we were trying to get away from the problem. Somebody typed the problem in the chat room. What are they talking about? What they're talking about is that these Southern blacks who came in from the West, who came in from the South and went to the West and to the North, uh, part of the issue was their propensity to do crime. They had a higher rate of crime and violence, higher out of wedlock birth rates. And the pattern was notably different for northern born blacks. And it caused problems. Because now all these people are part of the community. And so now you as a black person who's done everything he's supposed to do and made the right decisions, he or she, now, this is your problem. This is in your community because they're in your schools. And this is what Anton, uh, uh, the, the brother Anton was trying to sell, uh, tell uh, Boyce, Jack, Jack, uh, Boyce uh, Watkins the other day. You, Mr. Watkins, Dr. Watkins, are justifying this degenerate behavior. You're allowing these women to be rewarded with a good man who will help them take care of those children, which was a problem. Instead of exercising discretion and marrying before they carry, or at least not having a baby by a man who's had 10, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight kids from all these different women, he didn't do right by them, but somehow you think you special. That's my problem with Boyce Watkins. That's my problem with Dr. Uh, 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 Umar Johnson. They help sanction this degenerate behavior by not allowing men to hold these women accountable. The reason that there are more black men in the middle class now in 2024 than there was in 1960 is because over the past 50 or 60 years, black men, white men, the whole country, black women have held black men responsible for their actions, even things that's not our responsibility. And so what's happened? We've picked ourselves up. We've become plumbers. We've become electricians. We've become doctors. We've become lawyers. We've done better because you've held us accountable. Get your education, stay out of jail. The reason that the incarceration rate has dropped so much since 2006 to the fact that there's less than 1% of black men in prison, I think it's 1.5 million black men in prison or less, is because we were held accountable. So in order for us to get, now what happened if nobody held us accountable? We wouldn't have had the incentive to get better. And so as long as you have a learned man, a degreed man like Dr. Boyce Watkins and Umar Johnson defending these black women and their degenerate behavior, they have no incentive to get better. Now, they'll call it bashing. They'll say you're bashing a black woman. Really, they're saying that because when they say that, 
it means black women will support them. But at the end of the day, black women know that they're being degenerate. You know, twerking on the table is not something that your grandma would want to see you do. You know that having three or four children out of wedlock is not something that somebody in your church that helped raise you and put you in and 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 taught you in your Sunday school wants you to do. And so, what do you think these women think about these men like Dr. Umar Johnson and Boyce Watkins? When they hear them saying this, they like to hear it. It helps them win an argument. But it makes them see those men as disingenuous. And that's why they're so quick to turn on them. Look at the world. Look at them, how they're turning on Dr. Umar Johnson right now. Look how they're so quick to throw him under the bus now. Nobody respects a simp. And the way Anton Daniels ate Dr. Boyce Watkins up, he made him retract everything he said. Shout out to Anton Daniels. That was a magnificent uh, 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 response and rebuttal you gave to him. Shout out to my man, Cody Marshall. But either way, this is why I have a problem with these people. Because if you defend this degenerate behavior, it gives these women no incentive to correct themselves, and it continues to spiral downhill. Now, what happened as these black folks moved in? Uh, we talked about the violent crime rate went up. This is the 1960s. It was a quick slide to the 70s and the 80s. These same people were still in charge when the dope hit the hood. And they destroyed the community that we haven't rebounded since then. We talked about that earlier. Increased racial segregation in housing. And what did that do? Well, if your education system is funded by the property taxes and you got all these white folks moving out of the ghetto because you got all these ghetto blacks coming in from the South, what's that going to do? It's going to drive down the quality of your schools, man. You see how all this is happening? See, in, unless you have a big picture of history, unless you really look at it, you really don't understand. So the Southern Blacks moved in to places like New York and, and, and New Jersey and, and Detroit and, and Chicago and Seattle and, 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 and Los Angeles and Oakland. And you already had black folks there. But when the Southern Blacks moved in, the black folk, the white folks said, no, nah, we're going to get out these ghettos. We don't want to be around these white folk. Mm -mm. We don't want to be around these black folk. No. Nah. That's your problem. And so they left. And so it drove down the quality of the schools. Not only did they leave the schools, they left the city so they wouldn't have to be in the, in the, in the district. Moved way out to the suburbs. All because they was trying to get away from those ghetto blacks. They already had their own ghetto whites to deal with, the Okies and the Arkies. But white folks know how to shame their people into doing better. Shout out to my man, Jamal Smith. Thank you so much for the super sticker. Black folks want to integrate our, we got, we folks that we're the only group of people that accepts dating on different levels. You can have a man who is a, a, a upper middle class or rich, and he's expected to date one of these ghetto hood rats. Somebody type hood rat in the chat room. You can have a woman who comes from an upper middle class uh, community, neighborhood, and there, she she might have to date. She's not considered cool or down unless she's dating some ghetto uh, thug. Shout out to Seminole 2014. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this history lesson for us, Uncle. D gives perspective that culture one is raised in monumental and progression or regression of individual. May God continue to bless you. Thank you so much, fam. I appreciate that. It was very heartfelt. And shout out to Kwame Smith. So what was the impact? What's the backlash? Well, the white folks moved out. The established blacks got swarmed with, with all these ghetto folks. You had a retro, you had a regression in race relations, stricter racial segregation, all because nobody wanted to be around these ghetto folks, man. These Southern blacks, they were less educated. They were less acculturated. They strained the job market. It changed the social dynamic. 
It gave rise to those northern ghettos, those western ghettos. It set everything back. It was a problem. And a lot of these cultural practices and behaviors were rooted in the Southern experience. And the clash that the Northern blacks and the more acculturated blacks had with these Southern blacks, values, marriage, marry before you carry, out of wedlock sex, going to church, working hard, gambling, drinking, party, all that, hanging out all night. There was a time when living in the urban city meant you more sophisticated. And then when all the Southern blacks came, it got ghetto quick. You had to move to the suburbs to get away from them. The blacks who had already been established, they saw the migrants as hindering their social economic advancement as a whole. A lot of the established blacks, they feared the negative stereotypes associated with migrants. And they saw that they were going they recognized that they were going to undermine the gains that they had made fighting discrimination and securing better economic and social opportunities. And largely, if you dig deep, if you look beneath it, that's what a lot of you all fear too, with the influx of these black and Latino migrants. Let's think about that for a minute. We're going to come back and we're going to have some more conversations. In the meantime, we'll uh, we'll take a quick break. This right burning back. podcast, click your mouth pad. Yeah, we out back. Uh, hit the like, hit subscribe. Don't just hate watch the we outside. Uh, let them hate watch. Go and play pop. We just lay by. He don't play that. We don't play back. We don't play back. We go way back. Black man, yeah, we earn some. Tune in, gotta learn some. Uncle D podcast, bump it. Likes up, hit the sub button. Black man, yeah, we earn some. Tune in, gotta learn some. Uncle D podcast, bump it. Likes up, hit the sub button. This is Dennis Burden Podcast. Don't just hate, watch. Hit subscribe and let them know we outside. Don't hold hate, donate. Super chat, cash app. Put something in the collection plate. Church. Church. <laughs> I want y'all to make sure y'all hit the number one button. And we're going to kind of get back to what we like to do over here, man. I need y'all to check in at a certain point when it's time to check in. I need to check in it, to check it in, to start happening again. We got to go ahead and get this algorithm pumping. Brother Spurley. Brother Spurley met his fiance in my mixed group and she was doing her thing ivy league educated beautiful sister he's a successful attorney now he's like Shh, that's my wife i'm gonna put her i'm gonna put her through law school and she's gonna become an attorney at my practice that's the kind of shit i'm talking about i, I want to call you back to the sister that called into my show who said when i first listened to you i didn't like you man shout out to uh brother kevin samuels you know his birthday is coming up on the 13th uh, yeah, we miss him, you know, we miss him and I, I know you all miss him too. So I want to make sure we acknowledge his birthday coming up on March 13th. I got something very special for you all here on my channel. So y'all make sure y'all tune in to the channel so we can, uh, celebrate the brother there. Somebody type, uh, hit K and S let's get the KS buttons punched, man. Shout out to Kevin Samuels. Y'all make sure y'all hit KS man. So we can acknowledge his passing. And uh, his life and his life and legacy. And uh, I got something special. I got a rant for you guys <laughs> coming up tomorrow about my thoughts on all these people who are uh, basically biting his style. But if you look, Kevin, look at Kevin Sam. Look how he dressed. 
right? You know why he's appealing to you guys? You know why Kevin was appealing? Look how he dressed. Look how he spoke, right? Now, 20 or 30 years ago at the height of the, you know, gangster rap revolution, Kevin would have not been appreciated as much as he is now, right? Because at that point in the 1980s, you still had more people who were living in the ghetto, more black people who were in the hood, more black people who were inundated with that ghetto mentality than you have now. See, now somebody like myself sitting up here with a suit on, a married, uh, middle-aged man, a professional, you guys are like, yeah, I want to be like that guy. Back in the day, y'all wanted to be like Puff Daddy. Uh, uh, <laughs> back in the day, y'all y'all want to be like Puff Daddy, huh? P. Diddy, whatever he's calling himself, right? Did any one of y'all want to be like P. Diddy right now? Y'all want to be, yeah, you know. Back in 1994, 95, you want to be like Tupac. You want to be like Biggie, huh? Y'all want to be like Tupac or Biggie right now, huh? Living that thug life six feet deep? Because that's where it ends up. You see? We're like, oh, no, nah, we don't want to be like that now. Because things have changed. See, what happens is when you get money, and I'm kind of break away and I'm going to come back to it. But what happens when you get money, your options change, your tastes change. That's why them hungry rappers that they used to be, they can't rap the same once they get you know, hundred million in the bank. It just it ain't coming out the same. Your taste change. Your quality of life is different. You don't see the world from the same perspective. Some of you guys started off as liberal and F the man and the white man is keeping me down. And now every two weeks, you're so happy to see that white man's check. You go sit up in them white folks, first class seats. Riding around in them white folks, European cars. Y'all love white folks. <laughs> How, you see what money did? You you get as many white presidents in your pocket and your bank account as you can. You see? Because many of you are now experiencing what we call uh, uh, the, the, the spoils of living in America. Matter of fact, you like, yeah, I want to keep this going. Matter of fact, I want to keep it going for my children. You vested in the situation now. But you're not like that when you're poor and you don't have anything to lose and you growing up in the ghetto and there's roaches and you live in a project. You're like, man, I ain't got nothing to lose. I'm not vested in this. Of course you want to fight the power. We went from fight the power to balling. Remember that? Remember the 1980s? We was fight the power. Dude, we were still ghetto then. I was still the people who grew up poor. Ghetto, fight the power. By the time 2010 showed up, we balling. We popping bottles and everything. Go try it. Why do you think all these rappers are turning Republican now? All these old school rappers who was gangster rappers and they were fighting the system? Because they rich. They have a vested interest in the well-being of this country because they've made uh, middle class and upper middle class lifestyle. I mean, let, can we keep it 100 with each other, man? If you're watching this broadcast, that means you even have a computer or an expensive iPhone or something like that, and you can afford to sit up here and listen to me uh, uh, squawk on the Internet. And the reason you're watching me because you can identify with me because you know I'm going to say something that's safe. I'm not going to be up in here talking about, you know, let's go uh, in uh, – uh, what what, the, what they do? Let's go uh, march on the Capitol. I'm like, let's get this money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's Let's correct this bad behavior. Let's fix this degenerate uh, culture that we have. Let's go ahead and put this degenerate culture to his death so our children don't have to deal with it. You see what I'm saying? That's why you watch me, because you identify with me. It is what it is. But here's the thing. And I want to go ahead and put the rest. And shout out to my man, Sick With It, yo, John Singleton. Thank you so much, fam. And everybody else who's continue, uh, contributing to the cash app. I want to put the rest, the notion that... This black ghetto culture somehow stems from Africa because it doesn't. Africans are not ghetto like this. They might be poor. They might live in a third world country, but they got structure. It's patriarchal. Okay, that's the first thing. I know enough Africans to know whether you a dirt poor African, you have aspirations of that towards education and success. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you. I, I've taken some, 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 I've taken the time to really analyze some literature, literature. Um, and so I want to kind of talk to you about the shared cultural heritage between 
those Southern blacks and those white Southerners who came from the British Isles. And these are based on several notable examples I saw in Thomas Sowell's book. I didn't even know who this man was. I didn't know he was. I heard the name floating around. And, you know, of course, the, the pro-blacks hate him, right? But I'm like, man, let me listen to this, brother. The, the, you know what I'm starting to realize? And let me take a point of personal privilege. I'm starting to realize that anybody that the so-called pro-blacks hate is somebody that black folks who are well-to-do, upper middle class, and that's the majority of us, that's somebody we need to look into and kind of investigate. Anybody that the so-called pro-blacks hate, we need to investigate them a little bit more. Because a lot of these black men get a bad rap because they don't want to play the victim mentality. They, re they see the world for what it is. It it's it's going to be... Now, look, let, let, hold on a minute. Now, let me just say this. Some of these brothers, are, you know, some of them are too far. Some of these so-called conservative blacks and some of them are just, 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 they just, they doing too much. They got their little, uh, they, 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 they a little too, uh, they, not only are they in the house, they way up in the attic in the house. We can't do that. You know what I'm saying? That's not all of them. But if we're looking at a strict, from a strict educational standpoint, if you can read their literature and they, they can support it with facts and history, then you can't ignore that. So Thomas Sowell is a doctor. I believe he, I, I, Dom, I, so well, so well, I believe, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, in, 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 in economist, actually. And so he pointed out in his book, uh, I believe it's called Black Rednecks, that some of the religious practices amongst those Southern Blacks, they have an imprint from these white Southerners. And, and specifically, you know how sometimes we get on here saying, wow, yeah, ah, right? That hooping and hollering that we do, that the Southern blacks used to do in front of the congregation. We thought that was African. We thought, oh yeah, that much. No, nah, that ain't what they do. They might do it now because of the influence of the Southern Baptist preachers that they saw, they've seen on TV over the past 40, 50 years. But that actual, uh, that call and response, those sermons, that can be traced back to earlier centuries in Scotland where religious gatherings were occasions for like socializing, you see? And also romantic encounters. They used to get down at the, uh, on church day. You see what I'm saying? There was a time you wasn't working, you was off. So that's where that came from. All that hooping and hollering and catching the Holy Ghost and such, that's not African. Africans had an African spirituality. They wasn't doing all that like that. So just think about that. And here's another thing. We call it Ebonics. Are y'all mad? Let me know if you're mad. I know some. we got some blackity blacks up in here. If you're mad, be mad. Go ahead and be mad. Be mad at me if you want to. But we're going to keep talking about it. So... So, you know, I don't, a lot of that, those things that we think are germane to the black, it's not. It's not It's not black at all. It's not even African. We are so far removed from Africa. We're 50, 500 years removed from Africa. You, you, you don't speak any African language. Most of y'all don't even eat African-based food or African-based diet. So let's just see it for what it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're of African descent, but damn, most of us are mixed. At least what is it? Uh, 12, hell, 12%. Most white folks in the South have 12% Sub-Saharan African in them. Most black folks have about 30% uh, European in them. Or something else. Whether it's Indian, Chinese or whatever. But I want to talk about the black manner of speaking. Because remember, when these folk came up from the South, this is how they, they spoke Ebonics, their, their speech pattern, right? They said it was derived solely from our time as, as slaves. That drawl, right? But see, here's the problem. 
That same draw can be found in the greater upper Great Plains, Blue Ridge, Smoky, Cumberland Mountains. And those people had little to no uh, uh, interaction with black folks in the South. So how did they get the draw? How did those white folks in the Great Plains, in the Blue Ridge Rockies, and the Smoky Mountains get a Southern draw? It didn't come from African speech. How y'all doing? All right. That didn't come from an African speech. Africa do not speak like this. Speak fast like this, okay? This is how an African mind. Not like this. They don't, they, don't, that's, they don't even make sense. They got it from, they brought it with them from, from the UK. So that, that shows a shared cultural heritage rather than a direct influence from African speech. Social behaviors, this is what I like. Thomas Sowell calls it touchy pride. Somebody type touchy pride and hair trigger violence. <laughs> ah, whoo, that don't describe us. Somebody type touchy pride. Touchy pride. We see this a lot amongst black men in the ghetto, don't we? Touchy pride. Hair trigger the violence. Always quick. To, they saw the same thing in these rednecks in the earlier area era. This is what they, they got this from white folks. They came over here from the UK with that. Like, woo, touchy pride. One of, so, so there was an example in his book. He said it was a white man who didn't pay another white man his money. He said, I'm going to come back tomorrow with my friends and I'm going to shoot up your whole uh, uh, fam, family. Damn. All because I didn't pay you all because I fired you? My God. Yeah. That was a trait that black folk picked up from these whole white folks that came from the UK. Now look, you had rich, successful, upper echelon white folks too. And later on, after education took hold of Scotland and Ireland, the ones that came after the 1700s were far more sophisticated. But that early group, the ones you see up in the Appalachian Mountains and whatnot, they still there. Dealing with the same thing. Here's another one. These white folks who came from the UK early on, they had a disdain for education. Do y'all see the movie uh, Django? You know them white folks who were living in that, that little poverty house with the dog, all that? Disdain for education. Amongst antebellum whites. And what does that mirror? It mirrors these low performing black folks in the ghetto. They have a hostility towards education. Matter of fact, a lot of these folk from the in the hood, they had a hostility towards it's not the same as it is. It, it's not the same like when I was growing up. And before that, in the 1960s, it was worse. Shout out to MC Recovery. They literally would call you white and pick on you if you were a conscientious, conscientious student. You even still got black folks right now who refer to education, reading, writing, math, mathematics, science as the white man's education. Isn't that something? The irony is white folks got a lot of their information and education from other people around the world. And they took it and put it in books and such. And get it sold it back to you and you saying it's the white man's education. But this is the mindset of ghetto hood black folk. Here's another one. Somebody type welfare check in the chat room. Somebody type county check. 
Somebody type EBT in the chat room. Another cultural attitude that these Southern Blacks brought from the South that they share with these same white folks who came in from Ireland and Scotland is an aversion to work. Yes. An aversion to work. What does that mean? They don't want to work. There was a time in the South, it was a saying that you can't, a white man does no physical labor. All the physical labor was done by black men. Most of them were slaves or, or, or media workers. White men didn't do work. They had an aversion to labor. Why do you think they got all these people from all across the country and hell when slavery ended? Look what they did. They brought the Chinese over to build the doggone railroads, try to enslave the Indians, every damn body to do the do work for them. They had an aversion to work. So let's look at that. You got an aversion to work, proneness to violence, hell with education, sexual promiscuity, lively music and dance. We talked about, don't we have that? This is the same people. And this specific style of religious and political oratory. Those are the high, these are the cultural values. And they share this among these Southern whites. And that still exists amongst the black American culture right now. Here's another one. They don't like authority. Or let me say it like this. They have an aversion or skepticism towards centralized authority. And that mirrors the attitudes that was prevalent in their British ancestors. You got to understand something. Many of these people in the UK, and when we say UK, it stands for United Kingdom, Scotland, England, been at war for a long time. England basically was ruling everything. And that was those people, it was one island, right? But they considered it outside. This is outside rule. You can't tell us what to do. And they put up long-standing resistance to the external control. Basically, they was at war with each other. So they didn't like somebody who's not from there being in charge. Just like you don't like the police coming to your neighborhood telling you what to do. A lot of us. We have an aversion to authority. More on this religious fervor and the importance of music, especially when it comes to the communal worship, when we all together. Ooh, that's traced back to the Celtic. And, and, and British traditions, regional traditions. And they emphasize storytelling and music. And they made religion a deeply personal experience. That same thing we have. This is where we picked it up from. See? It's very interesting when you get down to it. Bottom line is, fam, uh, Black culture that we call black culture has nothing to do with Africa. It's something that was put upon us. And it has not been healthy for us. Somebody type ghetto in the chat room. It's ghetto. Ghetto culture. But as I said earlier, at first, when those people who were in those established black cities and towns around America had to deal with the onslaught of folks coming in from the South, with this ghetto culture. They outnumbered them. So they couldn't do anything but be surrounded. What do you do when you're surrounded? Not much you can do. But now, here we are, nearly 80, 100 years later, and things are different. Now, Two-thirds of black men are in the middle class. What does that mean? That means if two-thirds of, actually, I believe, uh, uh, I'm going to look this up real quick. 
Two thirds of black men in the middle class. Matter of fact, we're going to take a quick break. You guys, uh, we've been in here almost two hours. Uh, make sure y'all hit the number one button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We're going to take a quick break and I will be right back. Burning podcast, click your mouth pad. Yeah, we out back. Uh, hit the like, hit subscribe. Don't just hate watch we outside. Uh, let them hate watch. Go and play pop. We just lay by. He don't play that. We don't play back. We don't play back. We go way back. Black man, yeah, we earn some. Tune in, gotta learn something. Uncle D podcast, bump it. Likes up, hit the sub button. Black man, yeah, we earn something. Tune in, gotta learn something. Uncle D podcast, bump it. Likes up, hit the sub button. This is Dennis Burning Podcast. Don't just hate, watch. Hit subscribe and let them know we outside. Don't hold hate, donate. Super chat, cash chat. Put something in the collection plate. Church. Church. I want y'all to make sure y'all hit the number one button. And we're going to kind of get back to what we like to do over here, man. I need y'all to check in at a certain point when it's time to check in. I need to check in it, to check it in, to start happening again. We got to go ahead and get this algorithm pumping. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. So, uh, Back, Black to the Future, leaving ghetto culture behind. Look, um, as I said earlier, and as I've been saying, most black males reach middle class or higher. Here's what drives their success. This is an article from 2018. And uh, it basically says that six out of 10 black men, I want y'all to see this is important. Can you guys see what's on the screen? Let me know if you can see what's on the screen. Okay. You guys want to know all the answers? Why is... uh? Passport bro is such a big deal is because you have more options now, you see? And you're tired of dealing with the ghetto culture. You don't want to marry into a uh, culture uh, or, or get stuck with a woman who's of the ghetto culture. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of women out there these days. Who uh, 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 don't the ghetto culture here in the United States. And so what ends up happening? Brothers are like, well, All right. Sorry about that, guys. Sorry about that. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Hit the number one button if you can hear me clearly. Somebody said I was breaking up. But basically, I put this article, and I'm going to just put it in here for you guys to see it. It basically says that six, six out of ten black men have reached the middle class. And, and so, and, and, and the article actually goes on to explain that back in the 1960s, it was a little over a third of black people, black men specifically, who had um, who who were in the middle class, and because of that, 
you know, they had us, they had us outnumbered. But at this point, it's more of us than it is of them. And uh, you know, and this has been basically a 20% increase. And that's this is the article. I'm gonna see if I can pull it up again. Y'all hang with me. If I go dark, don't run away. Y'all hit the number one button, man. Um, and let me know you can see me. So here it is. Nearly six in ten black men reach the middle class or higher by middle age. A nearly 20% increase compared to 1960, and the share and, and share living and the share living in poverty has dropped from 41% to 18%. So at you know, there was damn near half of us were living in poverty. Now that's only 18%. And this 18% right here, students, babies, old people, old men. You see what I mean? So basically, you got 72% of black men, either they, I'm sorry, 82% of black men. This is the number. 82% of black men are either in the middle class, upper middle class. They're working. They're working poor, but they are working. When you have numbers like that, when you have numbers like that, that means their perspective is going to change. And that's what you see happening. You want to know why black men aren't taking this stuff anymore? You wonder why they're not willing to deal with ghetto chicks anymore? Because they don't have to. Why they have a zero, why they're now willing, brave enough to call out some of the degenerate behavior in the black community? Because we don't have to deal with it anymore. Because our perspective has changed. Because we have upper middle class and middle class values. Because we're traveled. Because many of us have been in the military. Many of us have in our trucks and, and as, as we've traveled around the country and we see different lives and lifestyles. We see what we could have. We see the possibilities. And as opposed to living with a woman or having children with a woman or living in a ghetto, we'd rather be by ourselves. That's why 51% of black men single and unmarried. That's why you got so many black men saying, I'd rather marry out and find a woman of the same or equal value system than just deal with a woman just because she's black. This is where we are, okay? But at this point, family, it's time to leave this ghetto culture behind, all right? This is where we at. It's time to leave this ghetto culture behind. Shout out to my man, Salty Balls. Thank you so much, bro. Always good to have you up in here. Thank you. You said check the cash out. I don't see the cash out. But anyway, this is where we at. It's time to do that. It's time to leave the ghetto culture behind. And anybody, and I'm talking to the boys Watkinses of the world, anybody who supports that ghetto culture, oh, big shout out to uh uh the good the, the good the good deacon salty balls. Thank you so much for the uh uh 98 dollars, man. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, bro. It's always good to have you up in here. Uh, we're talking about a very serious subject because now it's all coming to a head. It's all coming to a head. It's a great awakening. It's a great separation. When those Southern migrants came to these Northern and Western cities with this ghetto mentality that they picked up down South from these rednecks and, 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 and white folks who came over from England and uh, the UK we inherited that and we had to deal with that. But over time, we've been able to do what? We've been able to pull ourselves up by so-called bootstraps. We've been able to uplift ourselves. We've been able to get our education. We've been able to develop these trades. We have a different system now. We have a different, a different set of cultural values than the ones I even grew up with. See, when I was young, my mother told me if somebody hits you, you hit them back harder. That's that ghetto culture. That's that touchy pride. You go ahead and hit somebody back harder now and they fall on the pavement and, and, and crack their skull. You're going to be in prison. Now what do we do? You got people like 50 Cent saying avoid conflict at all costs. If it ain't worth pulling a gun out on somebody, it's not worth a conflict. This is, this is what happens. This man's been shot five, nine times. He came out with gangster rap. It, 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 when gangster rap was damn near dead. And now he's telling you to avoid conflict of all costs. 
That's what $50 million does with you. That's what success does to you. What does that say? If you get, you got Ice Cube making kid movies, talking about he wants to meet with Donald Trump. What does that tell you? This is F the police himself, man. What does that tell you? It tells you that there are more, <laughs> it, it tells you what success does. So hell with what these, uh, you know, hell with what these so-called poverty pimps and these ghetto uh, uh, empowered blackity blacks are talking to you. Hell with what they're talking about, man. Now, at this point, look, you might not have the money you want to have. You might not have the education. You might not be where you want to have be. But it's time for us to start rewarding dignity and grace and civility and separating ourselves from degeneracy and hood culture and ghetto culture and that unnecessary violent culture. That's what it's time to do. Because, look, it was us in the 1980s that sold us out. Yeah, I know. They made crack cocaine available. They made cocaine available for us to do what? Sell it to ourselves. They didn't let you sell it in the white neighborhoods. You sold it to yourselves. Why? Because we had a spiraling down degenerate culture that came out of the South where a black man's life, a black woman's life, a black child's life, meant nothing. We were living in the ghetto. We were impoverished. We saw no value in ourselves. If somebody lay a pistol on the table, that don't mean you got to pick it up and shoot your brother and sister. It's your value system that allows you to do that. So now it's time to recognize that that was a degenerate value system, one that was superimposed upon us by white folks who came from the UK, and then we can let it go. It's not ours. It's not authentically African anyway. You don't want to know what African culture is. We got enough Africans in the United States right now that we could ask them about African culture. We don't need to go ahead and try to guess and make it up anymore as we go along. Kwanzaa is not an African holiday. It's some some people in California made up in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s it's just a whole made up guy. Jumping the broom is not an African uh, 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 celebration of marriage. That's something that some poor white folks in England thought up and brought it to the United States. And black folks on the plantation saw them doing it, and we decided to do it. Speaking slang and ebonics is not African. That's just some bad English that we picked up from the Irish and the Scottish and the poor English that came to the United States and we picked it up from them. That's not us. So it's time to do better, fam. It's time for us to do better. It's time for us as black people to go ahead and raise ourselves up out this degenerate culture. We have enough acculturated people in the black community now that we can begin to do what? Do better. Now that we know better, right on the hip of your, uh, right on your hip, you have one of the most powerful information tools that the world has ever seen. You have a whole library right here that you can look up and verify everything that's been said on this broadcast. Stop listening to these poverty pimps, man. Stop listening to these poverty pimps. If you live in America, you have access to, to one of the wealthiest streams of income that has ever existed on this planet. Stop listening to these poverty pimps. You are not in poverty if you live in the United States. We have fail safe after fail safe. You literally have to be strung out on drugs and, and unable to work or unwilling to work to be impoverished in this country. You just got to damn near have made some horrible mistakes to be impoverished. And even for the people who are strung out on drugs and can't work and won't work, you still won't starve. We still have homeless shelters to feed people. 
Shout out to my man, International Choir Storm. Support Black Male Media. And big shout out to Cody Marshall. Even HUD is reducing public housing for mixed income housing. We need to learn discipline in the community. Yeah. Those safety nets are not going to be, it's not the same, man. We got too much money now. And everybody knows it. That's why you brothers won't do the jobs that you used to do. The reason they're bringing this underclass, this, this, this migrant class in, because these men are willing to do work that you brothers won't do anymore because you make too much money. My son is not going to cut lawns like I used to for 20 bucks an hour. I could barely get him to roll out the bed for $20 an hour. <laughs> are you kidding me? He want at least $50 an hour for messing around with my YouTube page and, and fixing stuff for me. Because he's the son of a lawyer. He lives in a, a, a half a million dollar house in the suburbs in Texas some darn way. His perspective is that he stays, flies first class flights. You're not going to get him to cut grass or like I did working six flags for six twenty five an hour. You're not going to get him to do it. So, but, but you can get a little migrant from uh, the Gambia to come do it. Some 22, 20 year old, he'll do it. <laughs> Somebody said, <laughs> my, my son said inflation is up. <laughs> Yeah, man. Inflation, man. My goodness. And so they're not, these migrants are coming over here to, to basically be the bottom of the pyramid because black Americans, especially black American men, have moved up. It's just jobs you won't do. You got too many engineers and doctors and lawyers and y'all not poor anymore, man. And so why are we acting like we poor? We're not living in the ghetto anymore. So why are we acting like we're living in the ghetto? Hell, the ghetto is being, uh, what is it called, uh, re <laughs> refurbished anyway. Some of these ghetto properties that I grew I remember the house that I used to live in from like 1990 until my mother sold it. That house is worth like $700,000 now. We don't even live gentrified, right? We don't even live in the ghetto anymore. If you sold your ghetto house right now, you would get like half a million dollars for it, easy. A brownstone in Brooklyn is like a million bucks. We're not, we're not a poor people, uh, brothers. Your woman got a $600 weave on right now and probably got a $1,000 pair of shoes in her closet. We're not poor. Why do we act ghetto? That is not African culture. That is a culture that we picked up from white folk while we were living down south. And then as we migrated throughout the country from the dirty south to Detroit, Chicago, Illinois, New York, Oklahoma, San Diego, Los Angeles, Seattle, we took it with us because that's all we knew. But now things have changed. It's been 60 years. The vast majority of you black men as of 2018, and it's more now, but 62, 63% of you brothers in the middle class, upper middle class, are you rich? Only 18% of black men live in poverty, and we're talking about children of single mothers and old men. So 82% of y'all are doing all right, or at least you got a job. How about that? Huh? And let's stop with the ghetto. Let's stop with the ghetto culture. It's time to leave that behind. Shout out to everybody who came through, man. I appreciate y'all, man. If you guys appreciate this, man, go ahead and hit the number one button. Subscribe to the channel. Show me some love. I appreciate you guys. And, um, you know, other than that, man, I love you guys. I appreciate y'all. And uh, as I always say at this time, this is Uncle D. And I am out. Going live.
been a minute, Blizzard King, this is winter, Dennis Sperling Podcast, you are rocking with the realest black men represented, ain't no lies cause we winning, catching flies, ain't no feelings, Uncle D, we the villain, baby, we just left the village, baby, now we in them villas, baby, Dennis Sperling Podcast, tuning in, we get it, baby, you can hate the player, hate the game, we love all you haters, hate watch, hate watch, calling lovely ladies, hands on your knees, bitch, bitch. you can thank us later, we snatching the crowns off of queens, we obliterate them, hella truth, chain the devil, they trying to eliminate us, you begging the sipping haters, peeling layers off of haters, whoa, southern Cadillac music like outcast, ain't jumping without bass, tennis burning podcast, whoa, southern Cadillac music like outcast, ain't jumping without bass, tennis burning podcast.